I hope you can all uh, hear me well. I'm actually too small, you know, to be behind here. So that, that's why I decided, you know, to keep the, yeah, the microphone. I think it's better. So first of all, um, I, we would like to thank, of course, the organizer of the Healthcare Cleaning Forum for, uh, you know, organizing this nice event and finally being able to see all of you face to face. So um, during this session, we're going to talk about environmental biofilm. So yeah, we slightly changed the title because I think, you know, this one is a little bit more, um, yeah, focused on what we're going to talk today together with uh, Dr. Ian. Um, so it's environmental biofilm, an emerging challenge in infection prevention and control. So thank you, Yolanta, for already, uh, you have made a really nice introduction, so I will quickly go to the outline of this session. So first, I'm going to talk about the biofilm fundamentals. So what is a biofilm? Um, how do they develop? And then um, Ian will follow with the biofilm in healthcare. So where do we find it? Where do we find them? Why are they um, uh, so um, important, why do we need to uh, know to how to detect them and why do we, um, yeah, what's the difference also between wet and dry surface biofilm, we'll talk about this, and why is it important, you know, to uh, control them and to understand um, the impact of those biofilm in a healthcare facilities. And then the third part of the um, session will be about biocidal efficacy against biofilm. So of course we would like to understand and to show how can you be sure that your disinfectant that you are currently using is actually effective against wet and dry surface biofilm. And we'll talk a bit about this as well, as well as the standardized methods that are available to approve the disinfection uh, efficacy. So. The first part, the biofilm fundamentals, I think we've already actually heard a couple of times during uh, this morning session, um, we talked a little bit about biofilm. Uh, I think Juliette Sévran aussi as well talks about the biofilm in the drain, in the shower. So of course we know it exists, right? Um, and why actually we should be interested in biofilm? So I, I like this, um, this sentence from Professor Luc Montagnier, where um, he, uh, he said, so our microbes find more and more subtle um, parades after the appearance of the multi-resistant genes to antibiotic comes the time um, biofilm resistant to the penetration of antibiotics and antibodies. So it's an emerging challenge and that's why we decided to really talk about it today uh, with you. So what is a biofilm? So it has been introduced in the 1978 as the preferred way of life in of most microorganisms. So if we kind of decompose the word uh, biofilm, we have bio for um, living and then film from the tin layer. So of course the biofilm is really an aggregate of bacteria cells that are attached to a surface. Um, it can be a living surface, for example, your dental plate, you know, in a mucous membrane. But it can also be a surface which is non-living, for example, a floor or an equipment. And um, biofilm consists of, so of course, microorganisms, so mostly bacteria, but it can be as well, it can consist of other types of microorganisms, such as fungi, yeast, and molds. And an important um, aspect that we will also talk about later on in the presentation is this extracellular polymeric substance, this EPS, you know, it's like this glue that it's really protecting the bacteria cells within this biofilm. And of course, this, this EPS, it consists of, you know, different types of uh, complex sugars, like starch, for example, and you also have proteins, and of course, 50 at to 95% of water. So it is widely known that in the nature, actually, you find most of the time uh, this mode of life, you know, this, this groupment, you know, it's like uh, we all like to, uh, you know, live in a community, right? We were not happy during COVID-19 because we had to be all isolated. It's a bit, you know, it's a bit the same with bacteria and biofilm, you know. So 80% of the time we will find this uh, biofilm, uh, this community type of life, um, uh, for the bacteria. So, 
here it might be you might wonder what what is this word actually? What is shimio film? So I did keep this slide because I'm from France originally, and we I hear sometimes you know some confusion between the term shimio film and biofilm and. What I mean by that is that chemiofilm is a successive deposit of detergent and or disinfectant, and this is non-living. So this is very different than a biofilm. And sometimes I hear, you know, oh yeah, we have biofilm. No, no, you don't have biofilm. It's actually more chemiofilm. And then indeed you can have your floor, you know, get sticky and you see these layers and you wonder what is that. So I think it's important to have really to make the distinction between the two terms. And biofilm is really, uh, it's of course living, it's a community of microorganisms. Uh, attached to a surface, like we discussed, and uh, those bacteria cells, they are able to secrete this EPS, uh, this uh, complex uh, glue, to really make a protective uh, barrier against the uh, outside world. So, I just said that actually it is a preferred way of life for bacteria, you know, to uh, live within a biofilm. And why is that? So it has several advantages uh, for the bacteria to live, uh, you know, in a biofilm. So of course, is the cooperation with different skilled organisms. So they are able to exchange genetic materials, and therefore they are able to acquire different phenotypic characteristics. So they can, you know, become stronger, more resistant, more tolerant to uh, antibiotics and to uh, disinfectants. So we talked about increased resistance because of this EPS layer that really act as a barrier. And we can also talk about tolerance. So it's really this uh, EPS layer, this really this glue that is protecting the bacteria from the harsh environment, from drying out, from desiccation, from antibodies, from, anti uh, from, uh, from disinfectant. And of course, they can uh, attach to a wide range of environmental surfaces. So of course, we all know them in drains and showers, but we're going to talk also in this presentation about other you know, type of biofilm. So I think just a little bit very quickly on into how actually a biofilm develops. So it can go actually uh, quite fast. I mean, you you all know, the, you know, for example, the the wet biofilm that we have, you know, the dental plaque, you know, I mean, it's it can form quite uh, rapidly, and that's why we need to go to the dentist and you know uh, to remove it. Um, so it can it has several steps, several stages. So the first stage is, of course, the attachment to the bacteria to the surface. Then the second step is really the cell adhesion. So that means the bacteria will start secreting this EPS layer. So you will have the formation of this uh, protective barrier. And then the third step is the proliferation. So where really the, actually it becomes a real biofilm. So the biofilm matures. And then in the last step, so you will have really this three-dimensional type of biofilms. And of course, once you know, the biofilm is at a certain stage, it's, uh, it's a critical mass, then it will start you know, dispersing around planktonic bacteria. And these planktonic bacteria will, are going to be able, of course, to you know, go to another surface. And then it starts again. So, Metabolic activity in a biofilm micro uh, microcolony. Just you know, so we said that indeed the, um, the biofilm is the preferred way of life for bacteria compared to planktonic bacteria. So planktonic bacteria is just bacteria that are living, you know, suspended, floating around, so not in a community. And we also talked about the different advantages of uh, living in a biofilm for bacteria, and one of them is, of course, they are resistant, you know, to uh, the harsh environment. And why is that? There are several reasons, but one of the main reasons is really that uh, typically at the, at the surface uh, of, the, um, of, the back of, the back uh, of the biofilm, you will have, you know, uh, let's say a high activity. However, the uh, layers, you know, underneath are really going to become dormant. So that means uh, they are going to slow their uh, um, growth rate. And that's also why they are, you know, it's very difficult actually to remove completely a biofilm. Because if you 
do not have the right protocol or you do not have actually the right product, you might just be able to, you know, remove the first layer, which has, you know, a high metabolic activity. However, the layers underneath that are completely dormant are going to be very resistant to uh, the outside, you know, uh, aggression, such, such as the disinfectant. And on the visual below, so it's um, actually a picture that um, we took from uh, Davis in 2003. So it really represents the activity of antibiotics against a typical biofilm population. So you see the initial treatment is usually effective in killing the bacteria only, you know, really at the margin of the biofilm microcolony, so really, you know, on at the surface. And the bacteria deep within these microcolonies are not always killed by the antimicrobial uh, Asian. So this is really what I mean is that the capability of those bacteria actually to become dormant is really one of the reasons that makes the biofilm so, um, so difficult to remove. So wet uh, versus dry surface biofilm. So I think we have all know, you know what is a wet surface biofilm. We can see it actually with our own eyes. We can see it uh, in our showers. Um, it's, uh, so they are typically uh, 300 to 500 micrometers in thickness, visible, uh, and they can grow to be several centimeters thick. However, another um, type of dry surface biofilm and we're gonna um, Ian we're gonna you're gonna talk more as well about it uh, they are way of course smaller it means that they are not actually visible to the naked eyes and you will find them on hover mortal uh, surfaces and that's indeed an emerging issues um, there are a lot of studies in the literature about wet surface biofilm and you now, um, we're going to talk more about that, but you can find now in the literature as well um, the proof that indeed the dry surface biofilm actually it exists and you can find them in your uh, healthcare facilities. So now I'm going to get over, give over to uh, Ian and he's going to talk about the biofilm in healthcare in a little bit more detail. Over to you Ian. Thank you very much. And you will need this. Claire, thank you, thank you. I've got to handle both. So I think Claire's last comment was that the literature on dry surface biofilms is just emerging. And that will be the primary focus of my talk. So, Madam Chair, the delegates, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, the literature is emerging, and as happens in literature in an emerging field, it is not as clear as it could be. I've looked at it. It is not as clear. It will become much better. And that is not unusual in an emerging field. We remember when the pandemic struck, even Tony Fauci said, we do not need face masks in the public arena. The distinguished Tony Fauci, I worked at the NIH. So we can get it wrong. Things can be very uncertain at the beginning, and then we change our mind. We're now at that stage, I will show you, when we come to dry surface biofilms. It does not mean there is no basis, but it is not clear. Now, I will adopt a very empirical approach in talking to you. If there are infection prevention specialists here, bear with me. The approach may be too simple for you, but sometimes simplicity is not bad. Mrs. J is in the bed over there, and she has a vascular line. Tell me how she's going to get pseudoeruginosa into that line to cause an infection. How is that going to happen? How does it really happen? So an empirical approach, I justify sometimes to just make things clear. So one, the literature is not clear. Secondly, one of the foremost exponents of dry surface biofilms now in the literature is a colleague of mine from Cardiff. I rang him a couple of weeks ago. What is going on? What, what, why all this heat about this literature? I quote, Ian, it's out there, but we do not know its clinical relevance, unquote. We're not sure yet. It doesn't mean to say it is not relevant. It says we're not sure. Right, so every speaker has a certain uh, approach, a certain understanding, and you heard much this morning, uh, uh, really great presentations. If I were to give an empirical approach, it's just my opinion. Why bother with it? So I will define my approach now and maybe justify some of the comments I will make. Perhaps it will clarify a particular stance. So one of them is 
a firm belief, belief in the quality management approach to infection prevention and control. It is precisely why I changed the name infection control to infection prevention and control. Just look at the rhythm of the language. That doesn't just sound good. It's not because I woke up and had a great idea. It is based on the fundamental business theory, which uh, Andreas Whitmer mentioned this morning, that the airline industry builds redundancies. The theory behind that, apart from risk management, if we see, is total quality management. So, the food we had for lunch today, was it safe? Was it safe? We know in the food industry we use the principles of hazard analysis and critical control points. Give me a, 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 a worker who is properly trained. Give me ovens that work properly. Give me a, a, a distribution system that works properly. And the food you eat is probably safe. So quality management is process-oriented and it is a probabilistic discipline. Everything we do in infection prevention control, everything is based upon probability. I touched the surface. How much did I get in my hand? I washed my hand. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. How much did I remove? I now touch Mrs. G. How much got onto her? I can never sterilize my hand. So what matters is when I touch the surface, Claire mentioned the biofilm is here. How much got on it? That TQM principle is a key way of thinking, which you will see in my slides. So I'm establishing my approach. The other approach I want to mention is a certain uh, amount of sympathy for people in healthcare management. So we have the literature and the approach of IPNC, wash your hands, bring in a biocide, bring in whatever it might be, all important. But at the top of the hospital, a living, breeding entity with real people who are sick by definition, with real people who care for them, real people who are coming to work right now with worries about their mortgage, the cost of fuel, uh, 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 war, real people, in their hearts and minds, we cannot on one hand say you will be process driven but not forget the humanity of it. So the healthcare management structure is what defines the culture. So when we talk about the environment and we talk about clearly resources to clean the environment, who's going to pay for it? Does money come from magic? We have less money now. We're facing a worldwide recession. Supply chains are blown. Currencies are under threat. Sri Lanka is in trouble. Who's going to pay for it? It's easy for me to say, you will do it because we find a biofilm. Now, please get me more cleaners and more biocides. So, right, so, so TQM, process control, probability. Secondly, healthcare management. I've already defined the one I was trying to talk about as well, which is human behavior. People feel. People feel. So although we may say, I think it was a colleague this morning who mentioned, Alexandra said, we don't want to get rid of the humanity, but we want to prevent errors. A valid point. I guess what I would say is that we could never stop errors completely. So what you want to do is reduce the variation. Human variation is natural. The variation here that is intended produces a Banksy poetry. The human variation here gives you poetry and reggae. All the things we like come from human variation. That variation does not stop when they come to work. So you cannot say, please be creative here, please be a team worker, please be a leader. But when you get here to process controls, you must become a robot. You will do it exactly the same every way. You can't do that. What we can try to do is to reduce the level of variation to something that is reasonable. OK, right. So. Very quickly. This is the outline of the talk. Uh, biofilms have always existed. Claire mentioned that as a preferred way of life. In healthcare, we've always known about biofilm. The wet biofilm in the sink established. But even before that, we have clinical syndromes with biofilms. So we have, for example, bronchiectus, which I will talk about. Because I'm establishing an empirical approach, I will talk about biofilms quickly in the healthcare facilities or health healthcare as we've always known about it. 
but we've also had a literature coming from the 80s and 90s about the environment. We weren't sure before that it was all aspergillus. Then MRSA and C. diff and norovirus in particular, spectacular organism, norovirus. If you do not clean the environment, you get recurrent clusters all the way through. That is pretty well established. What is not established is this bit here. Is there some way of linking the dry surface biofilm, sorry, the dry surface biofilm, where are we now? Back, back, back. There we go, the dry surface biofilm with the data on the environment. And then when we get to, who was it who said it? Alexandra Peters again said, we need more data, but we have to make a decision now. Very powerful statement. You have to act now. Mrs. J is in the bed right now. Do I simply say, I don't have enough research? But Claire said, that I still have to study more. Don't worry about it. If we have data now, we have to act. And even if it's uncertain, we don't have the luxury of waiting in the healthcare business. So in healthcare, again, we're talking about biofilm. The diabetic ulcer on the surface is dead. It is a biofilm. Imagine, look at Claire's slide, imagine that on the surface of an ulcer. As she said, it's a preferred way of life. The biofilm in a diabetic ulcer creates the environment to support its own growth. And it decreases the ability of tissue, our tissue, to granulate, to form healthy tissue. The biofilm creates its own environment. So we've always had it in the healthcare, diabetic ulcers exist in the community, in the healthcare arena, uh, catheter-associated urinary tract infection. We know if you don't pull the catheter, you will not succeed. I'll save the patient's life by treating the bacteremia. If you want me to now get rid of the infection, pull the catheter. Because the biofilm has not been treated, Claire said that, it will bounce back. The biofilm is there. So as we move on, Costerson was the one who first brought it to our attention. He talks about persistent infections. There seems to be a correlate here between biofilm persistence and environment, biofilm persistence and disease, bronchiectasis, dilated bronchial system, uh, with bacteria on it, you can't get rid of that. The bacteria invade, you get a chest infection. I treated it with antibiotics. The biofilm recedes from invasion, if you like, back into the bronchial system. It is still there. So that data was always there. I thought this is an interesting term, phenotypic plasticity. Again, what uh, Claire was talking about, the different metabolic rates and so on. So I'm establishing we've known about biofilms. Vascular line-related bacteremia. Paul the line. We've known about that. We come now to the environment very quickly with uh, Stephanie Dancer. Again, although we knew about it, Stephanie was still making a plea here for more cleaning. And because the literature is emerging, there are some tensions. That happens in IPNC. There should be tensions. We note here Stephanie talking about that additional cleaning services is easier than improvements in hand hygiene compliance. Yet another colleague talking about the prevention and transmission of MDRO says that if you invest in hand hygiene compliance, you get a bigger bang for your buck. You actually reduce transmission much more than if you had an equal increase in the environment. There are tensions in the literature regarding the environment. We know it's important, but how important? We know that you have to have a process control. I am not one of the advocates who believes in the one ring. I'm always systems, so I will hit on every single point because she's in the bed. I don't have time to say improve this one and improve that one and improve that one. You do them all and I'm building in the controls. I'm working in the probability that she will not wash her hands perfectly. It's human. It's 8 o'clock at night. She's busy. She has to go home for her shift. Maybe she'll be rushing. She's touched the environment. How much has she touched? When did she touch it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is Stephanie. This is not her slide. It's my slide. I just made it up. But remember, when we talk about the environment and the patient, the patient contaminates the environment. But I want to talk about here, it's not just a patient. We have visitors coming in. Healthcare workers are in there. There is not a sterile hospital. There's no such thing, nor can we require a sterile hospital. You have the intensity of people, demented patients screaming, babies being born, visitors saying, can I not come in? How can we ever think of that? So that is, if we say the environment cannot be sterile, at what point do we then, what is our cut point? What is the limit that we try to achieve in saying this amount of decontamination is enough? That's a question that is debatable. 
The fact that somebody becomes colonized does not mean to say it will invade. If the objective is no healthcare infection, Mrs. G, and I have a process control, I can still stop her getting infected if I pull the line. If the line has been there for 10 days, it looks a bit red, I pull it. It may not invade. The objective must be kept in mind. It is not wash your hands primarily. It is not to keep the environment primarily. It is principally Mrs. J must not get infected. I would add one more, which I teach a registrar, she must not die. That is the final outcome. Don't get infected. Everything else is a process that we try to stop. This is now coming on to uh, uh, a bit of the literature on the environment, work I did with Jean-Yves Millard and myself, which has been quoted this morning by other colleagues saying that we know that the environment cannot be properly cleaned. There's variation in human behavior. You have the white, I think it was, uh, again, Alexandra, who demonstrated the white going around this way as opposed to one direction. So human variation is there. We have to have give them protocols as much as you can. There will be some variation, even the application of a protocol. But one wipe, use it and let it go. This work has now been quoted by other colleagues showing the same thing again. So we, make it, we must make it very clear to our cleaning staff or nursing staff. What I'm saying is that the variation in human behavior is there, but if you give them more clarity, then perhaps you can reduce the variation, you get a, a, a better outcome. This is coming on to now, um, how much time do I have left, Claire? 10 minutes? Fine. Okay. So I am now getting very quickly into the literature on the emerging literature on dry surface biofilms. So we've established that the biofilms exist, we've established the environment is important. I now want to see whether we can link the two. This paper by uh, Hugh and colleagues talks about intensive care unit where they have timidly cleaned some rooms and they found bacteria. They did find it. I can't deny that. What I will challenge though is what do you mean by terminal clean? Somebody's terminal clean is not the same as other people's terminal. Did you verify that? Can I assume because you said terminal clean it was done properly? Why did you not measure? Did you train your cleaners before? What are you trying to tell me here? That the cleaners are bad? Did you not train them beforehand? So although they found it, there is a, there's, a, there's one problem in the paper where I don't know what this means here. The paper from Costa is talking about bacterial load post-cleaning and they use molecular methods. If you use molecular methods, you amplify. You pick up dead nucleic acid. I don't know what that means clinically because I know the environment is not sterile. If the environment is not sterile, what does it mean to pick stuff up? If I have MDROs in surfaces which are proximal to patients, should it not be there? So when we have, oh, what did I do? There we go. Uh, this is, yeah, Costa's paper. When we get onto uh, this paper here by Lerberg, again talking about dry surface biofilms. This was a simulation trying to produce a DSP on a, a steel disc, and they talk about transferability. You touch and you move on and so forth. Uh, one of the important points they make when they compared various disinfectants and detergents is that without mechanical action, without the cleaning effect, you do not get the level of removal. Again, a process. You clean, you may have a biocide, you wash your hands, you remove the line. It must be process control all the way through each step. This one is interesting. This paper uh, talking about timidly cleaned items. Again, what does timidly clean mean? They took a key from a keyboard. You push your hands on a keyboard, your finger goes to the top. It doesn't touch the side. If you take a key out and you stick it in a broth, anybody who doesn't grow something should give up on the lab. Throw your lab away if you don't grow something. Should I bother with that? It should be there. So you find that the rigor of the studies, what, well, we find it's on a chair? Does it matter it's on a chair? Well, what does that mean? If, you tell, if, a, if an elderly patient is sitting on the chair and they touch this here, that's important, but it's the bottom of the chair. I do not care. I'm not going to waste time with the bottom. I'm not going to get my cleaners to waste their time doing that. I'll do the high touch surface and say, let's get on with it. This is a, a request from Hillary Humphreys, colleagues in Dublin, 
looking at bed rails. And I guess one, what his colleagues are saying here is that if we have biofilms on the bed rail, is there something in design that we can do? Standardize assessment clearly, but also design the bed rail better so that you can clean it more easily. But I want to focus on this word standardized assessment because when you look at the, this is the final slide, when you look at the literature as well, apart from tell me what is clean, what you define it as, the swabs are taken in some of these studies, and it's not clear how much they sampled, where they sampled, did you sample behind, did you sample the bottom of the chair? So I think when Hillary's talking there, the need for standardized methods in the field setting, tell me how we're going to, we do need that to get a bit more clarity from this data. So I've had a quick one through. Let me summarize. Biofilms already exist. We have them in human anatomy already, bronchiectasis. There's no device involved. Bi wet biofilms are there in the sink. We saw that this morning. Claire mentioned that. The case for the environment is established. We've had that data for many years, VRE, C. diff, and the most spectacular of them all, norovirus. Clearly established. What is new is that we have dry surface biofilms. And we know that cleaning does not remove the biofilm completely. So one question is, does, when, we, when we clean and we find residual contamination, is it because of a dry surface biofilm? Is that, is that the fundamental problem? That is work that is still emerging. And, and in terms of today, what do I do today going back to hospital? What do I tell people? What are the pragmatic things I could decide at this moment with the uncertainty? I think we can say DSBs exist, done. That is clear. We do not know how much is relevant. If this is a probabilistic discipline, I can tell you, well, can you give me less DSB than more? One. Can you give me a DSB without pathogens? Two. Because if it's an environment in a hospital, you will never not have a contaminated environment. I could stop the visitors that we don't have a hospital. Tell you what, don't bring in any patients. Not a problem, I can give you zero hospital infection. We're a living, breeding entity. That's what a hospital is. The pragmatic approach I would do would be to, to I, well, one, in the research side, please get the research done better. In terms of today, I would say it does exist. One of the colleagues this morning said, if we apply what we know now, perhaps we could do a better job. I would go back to my cleaning staff. I would say, I would love the photograph from Claire. I said, I'll show this to them. So this is what is out there. Now let's do a better job. The visual impact, do a better job. I don't know where this is going to go, but this does exist out there. I think that is probably where I should end, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ian. So let's quickly continue to the last part of the session. So I think we, we've talked about biofilm, uh, Ian, uh, you know, uh, you made a really amazing talk about, you know, um, the environment, the links between the two, the fact that they exist. But then, so now it's to go another step. So we know they are there. We know they are dry surface biofilm. So what to do, right? Um, so we, as diversity, we were interested to look at which type of tests are out there, which standardized methods I can use to assess, to analyze, to show if my disinfectant is actually capable to uh, remove biofilm. And here, um, so we took two examples. So as you know, in, in Europe, we have the CEN, TC216, uh, uh, the Committee for Chemical Disinfectant and Antiseptic. So this committee is the one establishing the norms, the European norm for our disinfectant product. So you might have all heard about uh, the EN14476, which was the norm required for um, the viricidal efficacy against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then on the other side, we have also the EPA for the North America, where they have also different types of standardized methods to prove the efficacy of a disinfectant. So, however, what are the tests available? Uh, when we look at the SEN, there are not actual test methods against, uh, to prove the biocidal efficacy against wet or dry surface biofilm. 
So that's why we um, looked at the EPA, and in the EPA, they have already a published wet biofilm test methods standard. Not yet a dry surface test biofilm method, but a wet one has already been published. So the question is, of course, is your disinfectant effective against uh, biofilm? And so the wet uh, biofilm testing method, I'm going to go quite quickly. So the, it's divided into two uh, SOPs. So you have um, the, the numbers here. That's really um, one is, of course, to grow the reproducible uh, biofilm. And the other part is, of course, to test the disinfectant against the Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm. And the standard log reduction is of six. And here you will see I just we just you know like summarize in very simple uh, schemat um, the test methods uh, from the EPA to prove um, to assess whether your disinfectant is effective against the wet biofilm. So you have of course the the growth where um, the CD, uh, CDC biofilm reactor is used. You have the formation, so the attachments, the adherence, you know steps what we discuss of the bacteria to the surface. You um, then you have the parasitic pump phase to get really a mature biofilm with you know you add some nutrients to really uh, get a mature three-dimensional layer biofilm, and then of course you have the second uh, part. So the second SOP is really to how to test the efficacy. So you have a rinse step. You uh, use, um, of course, coupons, you use a centrifuge, and then you have the enumeration phase where you do your serial dilution and then you are able to count uh, what is left. So that's for that was for the wet, and I invite you, if you want to know more about the wet biofilm EPA test method, to have a look uh, at the test method itself. But then, as we discussed, there are not actually now dry surface biofilm test methods to prove that your disinfectant can actually remove dry surface biofilm. So what we did at Diversity is that we, um, we developed an in vitro model of dry surface biofilm um, of Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa for the disinfectant efficacy testing. And we really investigate the effect of uh, the drying times, so 24 hours, 72 hours in this case, because we want to have those times that are realistic on um, you know, how often we are uh, cleaning and disinfecting our surfaces, and on the temperature of dry surface uh, biofilm development. And the result of um, the study was that dry surface biofilm can be developed at near room temperature and are predominantly really, you know, embedded in this EPS uh, layer. And despite, you know, a prolonged drying, the bacterial density of the dry surface biofilm per component uh, did not significantly uh, reduce uh, over time. So this is just a schematic, uh, again, approach of the um, dry surface in vitro mo uh, model test method that we have uh, developed in the study. So, of course, we follow, we use the EPA test method that is already published for the wet biofilm. And what we did is that we add, you know, several steps after it. So, of course, you have, first, you need to verify and validate that you have actually wet surface biofilm. Um, present, and then you have an enumeration step, a sonification step, and then you have the drying step, which is uh, important in this case to really get your dry surface biofilm. So, as I said, we selected the two um, two organisms, so the Staphylococcus aureus epsodomonas, 25 and 30 degrees and 21 degrees. So, of course, the goal is to stay within room temperature to be closer to the real, uh, you know, life uh, condition, and 24 and 72 hours. So, before I show you some result actually of um, from uh, those two test methods, so the wet biofilm surface method and the dry surface, I just wanted to talk a bit about the. Um, 
active, so the technology actually, because this is of course important, so which type of disinfection are you using, what is the active technology that you have in your disinfectant, so there are many different uh, active out there in the markets, of course the one that we uh, know because it's history and it's uh, an older technology is the chlorine, I think we had one of our colleagues this morning talking about that as well, then we had several over the years um, technology that you know um, were discovered and what I'm gonna um, focus on during the next couple of minutes it's about AHP so the hydrogen uh, peroxide and before to come into a bit more detail about AHP I just wanted to have a little review actually on what chemistry are more or less effective because as we discussed there are already you know scientific studies that looked at which type of chemistry are more or less effective to remove those dry surface biofilm. And here I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can see that there are references um, from different studies, one using uh, chlorine, um, another one from Almaturi where uh, they reported that after 10 minutes exposure, uh, it resulted in a 7 log uh, reduction. And then you have also, but then they still discover uh, some viable uh, cells and the, uh, after that. So that means, you know, the biofilm was not entirely uh, removed. And then you have another study from Machado where uh, here they um, assess, you know, the, the quads and they found that, you know, it's still, uh, of course, was present, showing that there was an ad adaptative response of the biofilm. So there are several studies out there that really uh, show that, you know, not all chemistry actually are effective to remove uh, biofilm. And we know from testing, and I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes, that AHP performs well, and we have studied to show it. And but of course I talked about you know, the actives, the technology, which type of active, which type of chemistry is actually effective to remove the biofilm, but it's not only that, right? So we need to have a look, of course, at um, the protocol. Uh, this is, you know, do you apply mechanical action, the type of cleaning material that you use, the frequency, how often you clean and disinfect, as well, of course, as the chemistry. So the formulation, which type of chemistry are you using in your disinfectant, and the contact time. Of course, I'm uh, in healthcare. We cannot. Uh, we you often don't have the time. We would like to have a contact time which is short and realistic. So, very quickly, um, HP, so accelerated hydrogen peroxide. So it's a safe and commonly used ingredient. So it's a mix of uh, tensioactive that is combined with low level of uh, hydrogen peroxide together and this really gives an excellent uh, cleaning and disinfection performance. So how does it work actually AHP? How does it work and how does it kill so efficiently uh, pathogen? It's an oxidizing action so it means that really um, it's going to bind to the outer layer of the cell of the bacteria and it's going to create really it's going to break down this outer uh, layer and the intracellular contents of the bacteria cell is going to uh, leak outside and so microorganism cannot adapt or resist to this mode of action it has a fast action and a broad spectrum as well. So, um, coming into uh, very quickly to this, is HP effective against biofilm? So that's the question that we at Diversity wanted to really answer. So the first study from Lean Back in 2018 used the EPA wet biofilm test methods. And then the second um, study used the in vitro test method that I've discussed previously from Chagar, and it has been published in 2022. So, yeah, very quickly on the um, wet biofilm test method from 2018 from Lindbag. So the goal was, of course, to assess, to evaluate the efficacy of eight type of disinfectants um, against Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas uh, biofilm based on different active, hydrogen peroxide, sodium hypochlorite, and quaternary ammoniums. And so the result is that the improved hydrogen peroxide, so the HP, as well as the sodium hypochlorite disinfectant, perform significantly better um, than the quaternary based uh, disinfectant on both Staphylococcus and Pseudonanas and pass the EPA efficacy standard of six log reduction. Um, and then 
so you have, of course, more details here. You have the reference to the study, so I really invite you to, to have a look. And the next um, and last methods um, uh, that I would like to show you is, of course, the dry surface biofilm. And in this study, so again, we uh, wanted to know if HP is actually effective at removing dry surface biofilm. And um, we tested seven uh, types of disinfectant against Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas. And we also wanted to understand the impact of the time. So after 24 hours and after 72 hours. So is there you know, a difference if you do not do anything after 24 or after 72? Will this impact you know, the, um, the removal of this biofilm? And we selected so several disinfectants again based on different types of chemistry. So you have the HP chlorine, quat, and alcohol. So, and the result here, so you see the different type of chemistry that we use on the slide, is that for, in this case, is the biocidal efficacy uh, against dry uh, Staphylococcus uh, biofilm, there was no significant difference between the 24 hours and 72 hours uh, for uh, the Staphylococcus. However, if we look at the dry surface biofilm from Pseudomonas, we saw that there was a significant greater log reduction we observed with the, at after 24 hours compared to 72 hours. So then we wonder, why is that? Why actually uh, after 72 hours, you know, I do not have the same log reduction that I have at 24 hours? And we saw that after 72 hours, it w the biofilm was really covered completely by this EPS um, um, layer. So really this, this EPS layer was the one uh, responsible really for, uh, for this result because it's harder to remove. Um, it was harder to remove after 72 hours because the biofilm at that time was already a mature uh, biofilm. So just to summarize, the type of microbial strain, you know, we have seen the difference between Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas. The type of active disinfectant that you are using, we also have observed differences between HP and quaternary ammonium. Uh, the drying time after 24 hours, after 72 hours, uh, really impact the disinfecting uh, effectiveness against dry surface biofilm. And I think. Um, it's important, of course, when you want to select your disinfectant, we talked about the efficacy against disinfectant, but there are other criteria, of course, to take into account while selecting a disinfectant. So those criteria have been discussed in Hutala's paper. Um, and you can see here, we looked at and compare all of these criteria with the HP uh, disinfectant. And uh, you see that you know, we are, the HP type of disinfectant is really um, you know, covering quite a lot of those criteria. However, they are not the perfect disinfectant. If someone tell you, you know, I found the disinfectant that you have everything green, that does not exist. It's all a matter of trade-off. So I think depending on what you are looking for, then uh, keep in mind those criteria that will definitely help uh, to select what's the best disinfectant for your facility. And I think I've... Yes, so here is our Oxivir range of disinfectants, so cleaner disinfectants. So they are not only disinfectant, that means they also clean and disinfect in one step. They have been tested against numerous European norms in dirty condition as well. We have our Excel range for our daily cleaning and disinfection and our Oxivir sporicide, which is for the outbreak um, uh, task and of course um, they are really having the latest European norms against medical area and I think we're gonna conclude uh, together with Ian so the first point um, of the presentation what about you know what is the biofilm so biofilm are the preferred mode of bacterial growth microorganisms are more resistant to cleaning and biocidal activity within a biofilm than in the planktonic state I think we've really talked about this, and then I think, Ian, I will send over to you. Thank you, Claire. So I think we've established that environmental contamination data uh, affecting hospital infection rates is already established. What the new data is showing that biofilms enable persisting environmental contamination, and that might explain why it is when we clean, even if we take account of the areas which are missed, we still find persistent bacteria in particular. 
I think, as I mentioned before, there's a need for standardized methods in the literature to assess biofilms. So how much? I think it was Professor Pitay mentioned this morning the concept of zones. So hematology and oncology is different to elderly care. They're all important, but hemonc is a critical area. ISU is critical. But even in the unit itself, there are zonal differences. So do I care at the bottom of the chair? No. Do I care about the wall? No. I do care about the horizontal surface next to the patient. I do care about the bedside. I do not care about the bedding. People get excited about the bedding. You change your bedding, please, and send it to the laundry. I will keep this one. You got your one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, so as I said, there are no European test methods today to really um, show that your disinfectant is effective against biofilms. So there is really a need of internationally standardized methods for assessing biocellular efficacy against dry biofilm in vitro. However, I have showed you that you know diversity is really looking into that and we have developed this dry surface biofilm in vitro model to prove disinfection effectiveness. And that choosing a biocide which is more active against uh, biofilm within a proper cleaning protocol is likely to give more assurance in your decont decontamination uh, protocol. And I want to just uh, endorse what Claire said, the last line. Again, a probability discipline. It is a probability-based discipline. Nobody can debate that. We cannot give guarantees. What we're saying here, though, is we're trying to give more assurance of safety. And I think that that, that slide will stand. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.